Hello, wildlings. I'm your Creep Smith, and you found my Fear Forge. <laughs> Lucky you. Have you ever thought about how many predators you meet in a day? Most people prefer not to think too much about that. After all, that way lies paranoia, and people have lives to live. But one of the classic tactics of the villain is to pass as something else, anything else. Such is seen in today's tragic terror tale, shortlisted on Reedy Prompts contest number 147 and suggested by the wonderful Wendy Hill. Night Shift by Andy Highland. I watched Edna Powell die last night. I sat at her bedside and held her thin hand as her breathing slowed. I watched as her eyes became fixed and glazed and her skin became pale and waxy. I leaned forward and put my ear to her lips as the remnants of her final breath whispered. The death rattle signified the end. I let go of her cool hand and put my stethoscope against her chest to listen for the heartbeat that I knew was not there. A life had been lived. I stood up and took one last view of the scene before me. Taking a deep breath to ground myself, I stepped out from behind the privacy curtain and dimmed the light as I made my way to the duty station across the passage. Dr. Bobot answered after four rings. Yes, he said sleepily. Sorry to wake you, Dr. Bobot. It's Sister Turner from Ward 3B. I'm afraid Mrs. Powell has just passed away. Edna Powell? Really? He asked, sounding surprised. I really thought that she would hang on for at least a few more days. So did I, I said. I noticed she was struggling when I checked on her half an hour ago or so, so I increased her oxygen flow and sat with her. Ah, uh, bless you, Christine. She was fortunate to have you with her. They certainly don't make nurses like you anymore. I smiled at this compliment. Shall I notify the family? Please. And could you draw up the death certificate? I'll sign it in the morning during rounds. Will do, doctor. I disconnected the call and fetched Mrs. Powell's file from the pigeonhole marked bed 12 just as Avril returned from the tea lounge. What's up? She asked. I told her about Mrs. Powell's demise. Oh, how sad. Such a sweet old lady. I really thought she'd been around with us for a few more days. She passed me a notice of death from the top drawer. It wasn't unusual for people to die on our shift. Ward 3B was where they sent the patients who had exceeded all their options. Many of these were do not resuscitate patients for us to take care of and make comfortable in their final days. Edna Powell had been one such patient, end-stage bowel cancer. I picked up the handheld and dialed the next of kin listed on Edna's file. Her daughter sobbed quietly as I reassured her that her mother had not been alone and had passed away peacefully. Thank you, Sister Christine. You have no idea how comforting it is for me to hear that you were with her in her final moments. She opted not to come to the hospital, preferring to remember her mother as she'd been in life. I understand. Many families also make that choice, I said gently. I explained that someone would be in contact with her in the morning with a list of funeral homes and details for the collection of the death certificate. I reiterated how sorry I was for her loss. You really are incredible, you know, Avril said as I hung up. Uh, what do you mean? I said, picking up the form. Just the way you are with people. I don't think I'll ever get used to telling people their family member just died. You do it so calmly, almost flawlessly. Twenty years on the job, I sighed and wrote 11H23 next to time of death. Avril notified the mortuary as I quickly completed the rest of the details on the form. When I was done, she went to check on the other patients in the ward while I returned to Edna Powell's silent room to prepare her body for the afterlife. Her oxygen mask lay where I had placed it on her pillow so as to keep her final breaths unfettered. I disconnected the oxygen and her 
drip bag and removed her venous port from her hand. My hands looked almost red against her translucent blue skin, which was colder than it had been earlier. Dropping the mask, port, drip bag, and tubing into the red incineration bin, I listened to the familiar jingling of the equipment falling onto the used medicine vials. I opened an antiseptic swab and began wiping her face and neck. I didn't wear gloves, I preferred it that way. I rolled her frail, cancer-ravaged body onto her side and untied her hospital gown. Working quickly, I cleaned her front and back and then placed an absorbent pad beneath her pelvis to catch the fluids that would soon drain from her body. There was certainly no dignity in death. Finally, I positioned her thin arms close to her sides to make it easier for the undertakers when rigor set in. Once Edna Powell's corpse was cleaned and positioned, I leaned over her face and peered into her lifeless eyes. Goodbye, old lady. I closed her eyes with the palm of my hand. I was startled by Avril's voice from behind the curtain. Need some help? All done, I said, quickly pulling the sheet over Edna Powell's face. The rest of the shift passed relatively uneventfully. The porters moved Edna to the mortuary, Mrs. Johnson needed a sedative to help her sleep, and Mrs. Jamal needed additional pain meds, which I administered from the Schedule 7 cupboard, documenting it carefully in the register. I took my tea break on the third floor balcony adjacent to Ward 3B. As I watched the sun rise serenely over the sleeping city, I thought about how today the world would be different because there was one less person in it. At seven o'clock, I left Avril to do the handover to the day staff and fetched my bag from my locker. I scanned my access card and took the elevator to the ground floor. Taking the long route out the hospital, I turned left down the hallway to where the Employee of the Year awards were displayed. I paused and looked at a framed photo of a younger me, Sister Christine Turner, RN, Employee of the Year 2018. I smiled to myself. This is why I do what I do. On the bus home, I gazed out the window and watched people starting their day. The city was waking up as I was about to sleep. I thought of Edna Powell, now sleeping permanently. Death is a strange concept. We always say rest in peace, but do the dearly departed really rest? Is peace not just the end of suffering? When it came to Edna Powell, I knew the answer. Despite my long shift, I felt invigorated thinking about the role that I'd played in her passing. I had held the hands of many people as they took their last breath and passed to the other side. While most of them had been expected to die, not one of them had been ready to die. Each family Every doctor had been grateful for me having been with the patient as they took their final breath. In fact, I'd been told that it was my empathy with terminal patients and their families that had led to my Employee of the Year award. I exited the bus at my stop and briskly walked the short distance to my apartment. I couldn't wait to get home. Pushkin was waiting for me and curled his fluffy tail around my leg, meowing as I closed the door behind me. I turned on the kettle, dished up his breakfast, and watched him hoover it up. I got another one, I whispered to him. I went through to my bedroom and closed the curtains. I sang to myself as I changed out of my scrubs and showered. Ten minutes later, I climbed into bed with my tea, took out my cell phone, and clicked on photos. I'd been looking forward to this moment all night. I opened my most recent photo and saw the dead face of Edna Powell. Her mouth was open and lifeless eyes staring, unseeing from my screen. I swiped to the previous photo. Edna Powell again stared back at me, a look of fear across her face. This was taken right after I had injected a massive dose of beta blockers into her port along with enough insulin to fell a horse. I had needed her to die quickly before Avril returned from her tea break, but not before I told her that she was about to die and photographed her horrified response. 
I had even turned the lights up and removed her oxygen mask to get a better photo of my subject's expression. No, she had gasped weakly, the fatal chemical cocktail already taking effect. I switched back to the dead Edna photo and enlarged it with my forefinger and thumb. I made it so large that the entire screen was filled with her dead eyes. Gotcha, I whispered. I chuckled to myself as I toggled back and forth between dead Edna and live Edna. After a few minutes, I moved both photos into the folder where I had stored the pictures of the others who had come before Edna Powell. I'd built up quite a collection at this point. All of them had been expected to die, so none of them had required a post-mortem. I, a revered nursing sister with 20 years experience and an Employee of the Year award, had written natural causes on their death certificates. I had laid out their bodies and sent the evidence for incineration. I put my phone on charge, turned out the light, and rolled over. I killed Edna Powell last night. Hmm. Heroes? Villains? Who can say? You can only be a villain if someone else realizes that you are, and we're all heroes in our own assessment. Funny how that works. Stay scary, wildlings. Remember, they also serve who enjoy ending lives and make the most of your nights. <laughs>